Hello everyone and welcome to this, the latest episode of Book Time with Elvis with me, Mark. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about Herodotus. As some of you are aware, we are currently having a group read-along of the histories by Herodotus. And our tentative plan was to read book one in week one and then two books each week until we finish it. And for those of you who don't know, the histories are made up of nine books in total. Um, however, of course, this is not a rigid plan and some people, of course, have been reading, uh, reading at their own pace. Uh, at least one or two have already uh, read it through and finished it. Um, others are a little bit uh, behind, some are a little bit ahead, but you know, it doesn't matter. The main thing is that everybody is enjoying it and having fun. So I thought each time uh, I finished uh, one of the weeks, I would give you a kind of summary and my thoughts on that uh, or those uh, particular books. So uh, before I do that, however, for those of you who may not be um, up on your knowledge of Herodotus, I thought we'll just have a quick introduction to who, to him and who he is and that kind of thing. So first off, who was he? Well, he is considered by many uh, the father of history. At least this was the phrase coined by uh, the Roman orator Cicero. And this could be said to be true owing to the depth of his inquiries into past events and the way he tries to analyze them as a, a historian uh, would. He makes different uses of uh, various sources, be they primary, secondary, word of mouth, etc. Though he's often criticized for repeating uh, hearsay, legends and things that, you know, uh, probably just a bit too hard to believe. Uh, and uh, he gives these things as well, maybe a bit too much credence. And he's also criticized from time to time for being a, you know, out and out liar, really. Regardless of all this, however, The Histories is really good fun. It's a, it's, a, it's a really enjoyable read. And if you can sift through some of the more outrageous fact, factual claims, uh, there really are some valuable nuggets of knowledge to be found uh, in his writings. So he was born around the year 484 BC or BCE, if you prefer. And to put it in context, this is about four years before the Battle of uh, Thermopylae. Uh, if you're not sure what that was, it's a, it's a, it's a big event in the Greco-Persian War. And, uh, you know, think of the film 300 and, uh, and all the men in skimpy, skimpy, I don't know, what are they, Y-fronts with, with ripped abdomens and that kind of stuff. Uh, and this is also around 130 or so years before the advent of Alexander the Great or just under 500 years before the birth of Christ. So there you go. And he was born in the Greek city of Halicarnassus, which at that time was part of the Persian Empire. And today it is the city of Bodrum in modern Turkey. Uh, the city was ruled by a badass queen at the time by the name of um, uh, Artemisia, Artemisia I of Caria. And she, I think, I think, I, I, it was so terribly bad, I didn't even bother watching it. But it was in the kind of sequel, prequel to 300 in that film. I think she was in it. But she would take part in the Persian invasion of Greece. So I think it's perfectly reasonable to posit the notion that Herodotus himself, or Dottie to his friends, may actually, in his, in his childhood, have witnessed these preparations uh, for the events that he would later uh, have gone on to, to, to write about. Uh, and right, he did. Uh, unlike Homer, whose stories were uh, written down much later and after his death, if he even existed at all, um, Herodotus did ensure that his histories were written down in his lifetime. Uh, because, of course, a lot of stories and things were uh, in the oral tradition in those days. But, um, yeah, luckily for us, the, the histories were written, were written down. Uh, so he ensured that he was recorded for posterity. And what makes the history special compared to uh, the likes of um, the Iliad or the Odyssey is that they are conducted in prose as opposed to uh, poetry, which of course the Iliad and the Odyssey are, uh, and other Greek works of the time as well. So it was in the you know vernacular, really, as people spoke, Herodotus wrote. So... It was uh, probably met from that. I think that helps with its in endurance is that it's much easier to read than uh, the Odyssey and the Iliad, at least in, uh, in, one, in one go. Um, 
so the book starts off, of course, uh, with an introduction by him and a kind of disclaimer. He tells us who he is, where he's from, and he gives us an idea of what he's going to talk about and tell us. And he wants to point out that what happened, uh, it wants to point, he wants to show what happened from the points of view of both sides, be they uh, Greek or barbarian. And it's interesting, this phrase barbarian, because I think we look at it as extremely negative term uh, today, as somebody's un uncivilized, uncultured. But I, I think at the time, it just meant anybody who wasn't Greek. Uh, the Romans, of course, used this as well to, dis you know, to distinguish anyone who wasn't Roman or part of that civilization. It's probably a little bit like the Japanese word um, gaijin, gaikokujin, uh, which is kind of like outside person. Yeah. Uh, I did read, I uh, read a few supplementary texts 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 while i've been reading this uh, i was reading the oxford university press's short very short introduction to, to herodotus and the woman who writes that unfortunately her name escapes me but she i think she puts in her own translations maybe but she actually goes for the word foreigner which uh, i think is a little bit better because it just distinguishes them as being foreigners not necessarily uh, uncultured so there we go so it really just comes down to um, you know how it's how it's translated and how it's used, but he does try, as I say, to show events from both from both points of view, and he tells the stories of both sides. Instead of launching straight into the meat and potatoes of the Greco-Persian Wars, he feels it's important to give us some background, and so he goes back into the deep past. He goes back to the rapes of Europa, Io, Medea. Uh, I think it's also important to note here that the term rape probably isn't what you think it is, right? Uh, at that time, uh, I can't remember the word it, it's derived from, but I, I think uh, I'd read somewhere that it actually means abduction. So it's not necessarily anything sexual. Uh, he gives the abduction of Helen by Paris, um, which led to the Trojan War as, as being done in retaliation to these early examples of uh, Europa, Io and Medea. Um, yeah, though he makes it quite clear that he's not really sure that, you know, the Trojan War, if it happened, happened the way uh, Homer lets you believe it, do, it did. And he says that there are obviously, there are probably more underlying issues to these abductions and they may even in some cases have been consensual. And he gives a few examples of uh, some princess running away, you know, because she's got pregnant with um, a sailor on a ship and this kind of stuff. Uh, and it was interesting in our group that some members were worried about how Herodotus was going to portray women. Uh, because some of the translations didn't make it that clear whether or not some of the words being used were his or those uh, just kind of repeating uh, the, the, the opinions of others, be they the Persians or the Greeks. So, um, yeah, it does. With something like this, it can your, your enjoyment can depend very much on uh, which translation you are reading because we're all reading different ones. I'm reading this one uh, by Tom Holland. Um, yeah, so it's it's good. I'll talk a bit more about that in a bit. So anyways, the book moves on. Herodotus, Herodotus talks at length of the Lydians, and he starts off with the story of um, Candulus. Candulus, forgive me, I'm not educated in how to pronounce a lot of these names, so do forgive me if I if I butcher them. So, uh, Candulus, Candu 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 uh, he kind of, in this story, he wanted to show off his wife's beauty, and he wasn't content with just talking about it, and instead he goads one of his bodyguards, a, a chap called Gyges, into taking a gander for himself uh, as she undresses. So, he secretes himself away in a corner of the room and, and watches her get naked, really. Uh, of course, he's caught, and she offers him a choice. She can either, uh, he can either kill uh, Candules and take his place as husband and king, or he can be put to death for the audacity of spying on the queen and seeing her naked. So, not really a hard choice, and unsurprisingly, Gyges chooses uh, the former. Uh, he's then, of course, confirmed king of the Lydians, and he and his line are safe and secure. Well, there's a caveat to that at least for five generations, because according to the Oracle at Delphi, uh, something bad's gonna happen uh, in the fifth generation, and naturally we're gonna find out pretty soon what that is. Though I imagine being told that Gyges probably wasn't too concerned because it wasn't really going to affect him directly. 
Then we have a short interlude involving poets, pirates, dolphins, etc. before we reach this fifth generation and the Lydian king uh, Croesus, who's having, at the, when we meet him, he's having this kind of philo philosophical chat with um, Solon on what it means to be happy. And Croesus asks Solon, who, he, who Solon feels is the happiest man in the world, and he expects, of course, the answer to be himself, which, of course, it isn't, nor is he, according to Solon, even the, happy, the second happiest person in the world. Uh, and Solon says, well, you know, how, how on earth can he determine who's the happiest man in the world if, uh, if that person is still alive? So it seems that, you know, another caveat to this thing is that, you know, it all comes down to how happy and contented you are at the time of your death. So after this, things start to go downhill for Croesus until he is told uh, that there's some other things, but I'm not going to give in spoilers or, you know, too much information about all these things. It's just an overview. So things kind of start to go downhill for him uh, until he's told by the oracles that actually if he attacks Persia, a great empire will fall. And he thinks, great, I'm going to attack Persia. You probably see where this is going, don't you? Anyway, Herodotus likes to build up the tension, so we go off for a bit and have a look at what else is happening uh, in the in the local area. We see what's happening in, in Athens with with their tyrant. We we learn the story of how the Spartans rose up from obscurity, uh, and uh, also we get a description of many different tribes and clans throughout Asia Minor. Finally, Croesus and the Persians meet, and unsurprisingly. Croesus is defeated, and you guessed it, the great empire that was to fall was not the Persian Empire, but it was the Lydian, Croesus's empire, of course. So obviously Croesus is very disappointed by this, and of course he, he's going to be even more disappointed when he finds out that the Persian king, uh, Cyrus II, is actually going to have him roasted alive with some of his subjects. As to whether or not they are, well, you're just going to have to read it for yourself. And come on. Surely after hearing all this so far, why wouldn't you want to read it? You know, go on, give it a go. Anyway, moving on. Next, we get some background on the birth and childhood of Cyrus. And perhaps what is even our, I think, second reference to cannibalism in book one alone. But don't worry, there'll be more. Uh, book one then closes with further information about the Persian conquests and some insights and information into the conquered cultures, which are very interesting. I particularly love one story about the uh, Babylonian queen, uh, Nitocris, I think her name was, and this kind of trick that she played on, um, on people for the uh, subsequent generations. Let's see if I can find it. I hadn't actually planned uh, to read it out, hence why I'm looking now disorganized. Although I did plan what I was going to say, I didn't plan uh, on reading this particular part out. So I'm going to have to just have a quick look for it if you'll bear with me. Here we go. So I do like this bit. The same queen was also responsible for a notable trick devised against posterity. She had a tomb built for herself over the most frequented gate in the city, embedded within the fabric of the structure itself, directly above the lintel and engraved with the following inscription. Should any king who ascends the throne of Babylon after me find himself short of treasure, then let him open my tomb and take as much as he wants. Only poverty, however, will suffice as justification. No other will do, and better for him not to presume otherwise. This tomb remained undisturbed until the reign of Darius, who, unwillingly, unwilling to use the gate since it would have required him to drive directly underneath a corpse, thought it insufferable that one of the city gates should be out of bounds to him. On top of that, it struck him as ludicrous not to take the treasure when it was just sitting there, complete with its come-hither inscription. And so he opened up the tomb. Inside, however, he found no treasure waiting for him, but only the corpse and one further inscription that read, So this is the measure of your lust for treasure, and of the depths to which your greed has plunged you, that you think nothing of forcing the tomb of the dead. I like that. I thought that was really uh, a cool little tidbit there. So yeah, um, let's see, uh, where did I get up to? Uh, yeah, that's the kind of the end pretty much of, um, of book one. There's, there's some other information about um, Cyrus's uh, further conquest, as I've mentioned. And, you know, there's a, there's a confrontation with a, a tribe that 
is distinctly, uh, you know, Dothraki in feel. So I think we have an idea where Martin may have got, uh, George R.R. R. Martin may have got some idea for, for them. Uh, and that's the thing about Herodotus. You know, you'll notice when you read it, some of the stories will seem very familiar to you because you've probably seen films based on them, read books based on the stories. And it's he's really kind of woven into the fabric of our society so that he will be familiar even though you haven't read him before. Anyway, all very exciting stuff, isn't it? Aren't you tempted to give it a read? As I said, though, of course, a big part of whether you're not you'll in, whether or not you'll enjoy it will rest in which translation uh, you choose. So be careful about that. Uh, some will be drier than others, uh, and everyone in our group uh, is is reading. Uh, well, not everyone is reading something different, but there are at least I think uh, five different translations being read. Uh, by our group. Personally, I'd only read one translation uh, of the histories before, and that was uh, 20 years ago, and that was the 1954 um, Aubrey de Selincourt version, which uh, if you look at Rambling Raconteur, Jacket Rambling Raconteur's channel and his playlists on Herodotus, that is the version he's talking about, and I found it to be very readable and enjoyable. The edition I'm reading now, as I've already shown you, is the 2013 translation by Tom Holland, and that of course is Tom Holland, the historian, not Tom Holland, Spider-Man. Uh, and it's a much more kind of relaxed and conversational style than many of the translations that are out there. At first I was a little bit unsure about it, but now I can really say that I'm hugely enjoying it. So uh, for your information though, uh, if you're not ready to part with your cash in buying a translation because you don't know what one to get and you want to get a feel for the story, there are several translations of the histories in the public domain which you can download for free, of course, should you be interested. Anyway, I've talked enough about that. I hope I didn't spoil anything for everyone, but I do hope I maybe I've instilled you with uh, a little bit of curiosity to go and check out this wonderful and ancient book uh, that is it's actually really relatable to all of us today. So thank you very much for watching and look forward to seeing you all next time. Uh, will probably be tomorrow, but next time in this particular series about Herodotus when I will discuss uh, books two and three. So take care, everybody. Thanks for watching. All the best. Bye-bye.